Uh, back in the day before there was no such thing as a CT scan or an MRI scan, uh, a neuro-ophthalmologist was useful in actually letting the surgeon know where the lesion might be. Uh, but uh, the MRI scan trumps the visual field. Uh, nonetheless, if we were to look at this visual field, uh, at first it seems to be non-localizing. Uh, there's a lot of darkness in the left eye. The patient is aware of reduced vision in the left eye, some peripheral uh, temporal field loss in the right eye. Uh, but then when we look more closely, and the, the software of this program helps, uh, and if we come down to this area in the left eye, we see that there's a greater temporal deficit in the left eye than there is nasal deficit. And if we come down to the right eye, we see that there's a greater temporal deficit. The other thing we look at in trying to localize field abnormalities is whether or not there's a boundary along the vertical meridian, which would suggest something in the chiasm or behind the chiasm, or whether or not there's a boundary on the horizontal meridian, which is usually more specific for diseases that occur in the retina or at the junction of the optic nerve in the retina. Uh, so in this analysis, there does seem to be a vertical boundary, uh, especially in the right eye. So one would suggest that uh, this is uh, anterior chiasmal compression, uh, more so on the left side than the right. But of course, as we saw from the imaging study, uh, the chiasm was pretty well mashed. Uh, and in looking at the imaging study, superiorly there was more extension on the left side than the right. So it does allow us to, to understand the visual field. Uh, but um, the main importance of visual field analysis nowadays is to uh, outline the abnormality uh, and then to follow it over time to uh, look for potential signs of recurrence, particularly in skull-based meningioma uh, sometimes the visual field will become abnormal if the meningioma is proliferating across the planum or in the optic canal before you necessarily see a change on the imaging study. The reason I, the, the reason I uh, thought of uh, talking about escape from the cella uh, is basically if something in the cella escapes, uh, its escape route uh, is generally up or lateral. Uh, certainly there are things that can erode the floor of the cella and just expand into the sphenoid sinus. Uh, but if you go up, you're compressing the optic nerves or chiasm. And if you go lateral, you have a patient who's presenting with uh, double vision or ptosis. Um, this is from uh, Harvey Cushing's notes. Uh, and you can see a case that uh, he uh, analyzed in 1928 with a uh, bitemporal uh, deficit. Uh, and he demonstrated that after his uh, surgery that the visual fields had improved and the acuity had improved. Um, so in terms of uh, thinking about vision, uh, as we know, altered vision is often the first sign of a pituitary tumor, either reduced central vision in one or both eyes or altered peripheral vision or double vision. Uh, and patients with slow progressive optic nerve or chiasm compression may be unaware of reduced vision or visual field uh, and clinical ophthalmologic evaluation with visual field analysis is indicated. Even if the patient tells you there's no problem with their vision and their uh, tumor has been an incidental finding, uh, there's still some value in evaluating uh, the vision prior to surgery. Uh, in terms of uh, the benefit of uh, a neuro-ophthalmologic evaluation, uh, we're documenting uh, function and form. Uh, it also helps a great deal in terms of uh, prognosticating potential recovery of vision for the patient who has severe vision loss. Uh, and um, it uh, protects uh, the surgeon sometimes more than the patient. Uh, and again, this illustrates that if you come up out of the cella, you lose vision. If you go lateral from the uh, cella, you have double vision or ptosis. Uh, and as you know, there's a decussation at the uh, chiasm. Uh, and there's a typical chiasmal compression syndrome when the chiasm uh, uh, is dislocated uh, superiorly. Um, in terms of the full assessment, we're looking to see whether or not there's an altered globe or eyelid position, uh, the change in visual acuity or visual field, assessing the eye movement disorder, and whether or not in cavernous sinus lesions there's a disorder of the uh, fifth cranial nerve, and in other skull-based lesions whether or not there's a problem with the seventh cranial nerve. Uh, and again, uh, even if your patient uh, is unaware of their visual deficit before you operate on them, 
uh, they'll be aware of the same deficit even if it's no worse after you've operated on them. So documentation is important medical legally as well as uh, medically. Uh, it's amazing how much more attentive patients are to their visual function and their neurologic function after you've operated on them. Uh, and looking at the afferent system, uh, it's uh, useful to record visual acuity. Even if you have nothing more than a pocket card, uh, one should uh, ask the patient to read the card and record that in your note. Uh, if you don't have uh, time to request that the patient be evaluated at Jules Stein with visual field analysis, uh, it's still pertinent for you to do confrontation visual fields. Uh, Marvin asked me to comment on techniques. Uh, very often, uh, you start with the history. Uh, has the patient had any history of uh, lack of awareness of peripheral objects or altered vision in one eye or the other? Uh, other than uh, reading the uh, central acuity, you're also interested in relative optic nerve function. Uh, it's useful to ask them if they perceive light to be brighter in one eye than the other. Useful to show them a red target than if they perceive the redness to be brighter in one eye than the other, which can be an indication of relative uh, optic nerve dysfunction greater on one side than the other. Uh, also useful to simply ask them uh, if they look at a target, whether or not they see everything surrounding that target. So with one hand over the eye, uh, and it should be the palm of the hand, not the fingers, which they'll look through, but with one hand over the eye, uh, if you're sitting uh, speaking with them, it's useful to ask them to look at your nose and ask them if they see the entirety of your face, ask them if they see both ears, both eyes, ask them if they see your mouth while you're looking at your nose. Uh, and then as you advance uh, outward from central vision to look at confrontation fields, uh, much like the neurologists, uh, I like to use double simultaneous stimulation. So as they're looking at my eye with one eye covered, uh, I'll ask them how many fingers I'm holding up in total. Uh, and sometimes they'll be neglectful of a side that has a relative deficit, even if it's not a complete deficit, and you get a better sense of the peripheral vision in each eye by doing that. It's also important, uh, although it's fallen out of fashion, to actually look in the eye. Uh, do any of the residents uh, still carry an ophthalmoscope? I remember when that used to be uh, in everyone's pocket. Uh, but I would recommend that there still is some utility in looking in the eye, uh, although I'll forgive you if uh, you actually have an ophthalmologic colleague do that for you. Uh, one of the things I'm going to emphasize in my talk today is the utility of a newer test called ocular coherence tomography uh, in following patients as well as prognosticating uh, the potential for vision recovery. Um, and ocular coherence tomography uh, has already found a variety of neuroophthalmic uh, applications in terms of monitoring uh, MS patients, ischemic optic neuropathy patients, really any optic neuropathy, uh, compressive optic neuropathy, and I found it to be of great utility recently uh, in following patients with papilledema. We're always trying to grade, well, is the papilledema worse or is it better? Uh, and the appearance of the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer on the OCT study is much more sensitive uh, than a uh, two-dimensional photograph of your own view uh, through the ophthalmoscope. So in this case, for example, this is a 55-year-old woman uh, with MS. Uh, you can see that she's got enhancement of the optic nerve in the optic canal on the axial view and the coronal view. Uh, and this is her uh, OCT. Uh, in ocular coherence tomography, the optic nerve head is visualized. Uh, and then a... Uh, a tomogram, an optical tomogram, is taking of the retina in a circular fashion around the optic nerve. Uh, and the colored graph represents uh, normals. So the green is the range of normal in microns, uh, which you can see is uh, in some areas of the nerve uh, as thin as 50 microns and as other areas surrounding the nerve uh, almost 200 microns because the nerve fiber layer is normally thicker at the superior to inferior pole of the optic nerve. And the black tracing uh, is the measurement of the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in this particular patient. Uh, and then the pie chart uh, will show a green slice of pie where the retinal nerve fiber layer is of normal thickness, a yellow where it's borderline, and a red where it's abnormally thin. Uh, bear in mind that the retina varies in thickness from about 190 microns to 500 microns. And the retinal nerve fiber layer is the most superficial 
uh, innermost uh, layer of the retina, uh, which will vary from 50 to 200 microns. And in essence, the retinal nerve fiber layer are those 1.3 million uh, axons of the optic nerve. So by measuring the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer in the absence of disease, which would cause edema, uh, you're really getting a quantitative assessment of uh, the optic nerve fiber uh, density, which relates to uh, optic nerve uh, atrophy when there has been atrophy. Of course, if you have a disease process like pseudotumor cerebri that's swelling the optic nerve and the nerve fiber layer, then you see a measurement that's thicker than normal. Uh, and one can be fooled in a patient with resolving papilledema to think that because the papilledema is resolving, they're getting better. But remember that papilledema will also resolve when there's less tissue to swell. So one of the things that one worries about is that in your resolving papilledema, that it's not resolving because of optic atrophy. Uh, this is a 24-year-old woman uh, with headaches and blurred vision. Uh, and basically, you can see her retinal nerve fiber layer thickness is off the chart. Uh, but although it's off the chart, we still have recordings uh, that give us uh, thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer in particular regions and an average thickness. Uh, and then with effective treatment, as her papilledema resolves, we can monitor the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer. Uh, in a patient whose papilledema is resolving uh, because they're having damage to the optic nerve, obviously their vision is declining at the same time. And a patient whose papilledema is resolving because you've effectively treated them, uh, then you expect their vision to either remain the same or slowly improve. So in a setting where the vision is not declining but the papilledema is declining, then you can be relatively sure that your therapy is effective. Uh, this is a 44-year-old woman with compressive optic neuropathy on the right side. Uh, and we could see both in looking in the eye that there was mild pallor of the optic nerve, as well as in doing the OCT, that there was already an area of sectoral uh, atrophy of the optic nerve. So this woman would be told uh, before surgery uh, that the expectation or the hope is to maintain the vision that she has, but that we would not be too optimistic about great improvements in vision because she already has some degree of optic atrophy. Uh, as opposed to this woman, also with compressive optic neuropathy, who has normal thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer. Now remember that what we see inside the eye, whether it be with an ophthalmoscope or ocular coherence tomography, is a reflection of what had been. If one transects the chiasm, it'll take two months to see optic atrophy. If one severs the optic nerve at the orbital apex, it'll take one month to see optic atrophy. So one might be somewhat reserved and cautious uh, in telling a patient with this retinal nerve fiber layer thickness that you're certain that they'll recover their vision. But what I ordinarily do tell patients is that thus far, in looking in the eye, there's no evidence of permanent damage to their vision. And while there may be, we have reason to be hopeful that after treatment that there will be improvement in their vision. And looking at the efferent system, uh, we're looking at the uh, lid position, the orbit, whether or not there's globe displacement, eyelid position and function. Uh, is there double vision? Is there misalignment of the eyes? Uh, looking at the pupil size and reactions, uh, looking at tear production and uh, orbicularis function. Uh, and assessment of ocular alignment with correction of refractive error, that is, ask them to put their glasses on uh, at distance uh, and near uh, in primary position uh, is useful to look at. Not every patient with strabismus or misaligned eyes has a uh, active continued awareness of the displaced image, especially if the vision is reduced in one eye. So it's pertinent for you to look at the alignment of their eyes. They may have hand motion vision in one eye, uh, good vision in the opposite eye. The eye may be askew. They may deny having double vision. You do a great surgery, which allows them to recover vision in their hand motion eye, which now allows them to see double uh, and unless you have some documentation before surgery, a uh, doctor, what did you do? You caused me to have double vision. Uh, ductions are the range of movement of the eye, uh, and you don't have to uh, evaluate them quantitatively uh, or photographically, but it's good to ask your patient to look up, down, left, and right, uh, and subjectively to assess whether or not the movement of the eye is full, uh, and if there is some limitation to record that in your note. Uh, and uh, versions, uh, in this particular case of a uh, gentleman with a 
right fourth cranial nerve palsy. Uh, you can see that in the adducted position, the superior oblique isn't able to bring the eye down. So the, uh, the adducting eye has an upward position in the presence of fourth cranial nerve weakness. Um, even in the hospital room, uh, if your patient has reasonable vision in each eye, you can ask them to fixate on a target at the opposite side of the room, even if it's just a switch on the light panel. Uh, and then with your hand, uh, go from one eye to the other as they're looking at that switch. Uh, and so long as they have adequate acuity in each eye, you will see a slight offset as they fixate with one eye and the other eye, either horizontally or vertically. And sometimes if the offset is very slight, I'll ask my patient, as I go from eye to eye, does that target seem to move? Uh, and sometimes for very small angles of misalignment, the patient may perceive that movement as you go from eye to eye, even though you may not see the refix refixation movement. So if they perceive that movement, it's good for you to note that, that there's a slight horizontal offset or vertical offset in the alignment of their eyes. Uh, in the ophthalmology clinic, will actually measure the angle of offset uh, by prism neutralization, uh, but uh, most of the neurosurgery residents don't carry around uh, prism bars. Uh, these uh, T1 gadolinium enhanced images are those of a man with a chronic progressive optic neuropathy, uh, and you can see uh, characteristics of a small meningioma, uh, which is compressing his uh, left optic nerve. Uh, this is a 55-year-old man who uh, Felt well when he went to bed, but awakened with uh, severe reduction of vision in both eyes, headache, uh, and third nerve palsy on one side. Pituitary apoplexy. Uh, and here's his uh, MR, where you see this huge uh, blood cyst and uh, displacement of the chiasm. Uh, and you see his fluid fluid level uh, uh, in this uh, section uh, and in the T2. Uh, and what's interesting about compression of the visual pathway is if you act quickly, the recovery of vision is quick. Uh, and same with cranial nerves as well. Cranial nerves, of course, are more resilient than the optic nerve is. Uh, but the, uh, the speed of uh, decompression affects the, uh, the speed of recovery. Uh, and within one week, uh, this gentleman had recovered normal vision in each eye uh, and had uh, mild uh, residual third cranial nerve weakness, which uh, subsequently continued to clear. Uh, and here's his post-op MR. Uh, this is a 48-year-old woman. Uh, this particular patient uh, is from a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Steve Newman at University of Virginia. He and I uh, lecture together frequently. Uh, this is his patient who in uh, November of 2008 uh, noted a reduction in her vision. Uh, she was 20 over 30 in the uh, right eye, 8 over 200 in the left, and had an afferent pupil defect in the left eye. So again, as we discussed before, although this uh, field abnormality is more symmetric than uh, in your patient uh, RW, uh, here there's a defect not just in the temporal peripheral vision, uh, but also that uh, crosses fixation and involves the central vision. Uh, there's an afferent pupillary defect in that eye. Uh, and here there's a defect that uh, more strictly obeys the uh, vertical boundary. So again, we expect uh, compression uh, of the chiasm here uh, more anterior than posterior, and more left-sided than uh, right-sided. Uh, and here, in looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, it's normal. So this patient may have a good prognosis for recovery of vision. Uh, and this is also a uh, patient with a uh, craniopharyngioma. Uh, and this is the same patient um, the following year, uh, seen in the follow-up, where you can see that although there's not a complete recovery, uh, there's certainly a dramatic improvement uh, with a visual acuity of 20 over 20 in each eye uh, and perhaps just a little bit of optic atrophy. Uh, and the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness does show uh, some degree of optic atrophy, even though she has 20 over 20 acuity. Uh, and you can see that the, the discs are somewhat uh, pale, consistent with that. So although this is a patient where I would be optimistic in recovery, uh, and although she did recover 20-20 vision, um, you can see that there still was some uh, residual optic nerve damage. 